Welcome back, everyone. We're here at CPAC. We're sitting down with Natalie Winter. She's a journalist with the National Pulse, and she was the one who broke the story about all these different journalists getting paid by the Chinese Communist Party to go on dinners and so on. Hey, Natalie, real pleasure to have you on Crossroads. Thank you so much for having me. So why don't we start off with this story, and then I want to talk to you a bit about the bigger picture of this, because you've actually found public officials, academics, really kind of shocking amounts of ties to the Chinese Communist Party. But let's start Let's start off with the media. Sure. Uh, what did you find with the media working with the CCP? Yes, so at the National Pulse, we uncovered that an organization by the name of the China United States Exchange Foundation, which our very own government has identified repeatedly as working with China's United Front effort. So that specifically seeks to co-opt and neutralize any opposition to the Chinese Communist Party and really target elites in the West to push policies that advance uh, the desires of the Chinese Communist Party. And interestingly enough, aided and abetted by Western lobbying firms, specifically BLJ Worldwide, they were paying journalists, reporters, editors from at basically every Western media outlet, Newsweek, even Fox, CNN, Washington Post, all these uh, outlets that love to lecture us on journalistic integrity to take trips to China to tour not only military facilities, tour Huawei, uh, meet with Chinese Communist Party officials, and in exchange, when you read the Foreign Agent Registration Act filings, you see that they were forced to essentially provide, quote, favorable coverage and, uh, quote, disseminate positive information with regards to China. So in other words, they were regulating how they could cover China as they went on these paid trips with these Chinese agents. Yes. Yeah, so I think you kind of saw that play out in two forms. One, they wrote stories about China, uh, providing favorable viewpoints on the growth and rise of China. But also, too, you know, years later, they, they developed a relationship relationship with this organization by the name of QCEF, and they've continued to make overtures to these media outlets, so there's definitely a reason to not report so, so harshly on the Chinese government when you're effectively taking their money. So what is this organization? Let's talk a bit about this organization. Sure. So this is, I think, really kind of the primary offender, the, the most guilty actor when you talk about influence operations on American shores with, with regards to the Chinese Communist Party. So I would say really every level of, of institution in America, whether it's academia, Hollywood, government, and that's both current and former officials, have taken trips to China sponsored by this organization, uh, the China United States Exchange Foundation. Uh, we've really dug into it at the National Pulse. So specifically, Harvard University, they've co-authored reports with this group, which again is backed by the Chinese government. Our own government in 2018 identified it as part of the United Front effort. They've actually taken graduate students basically on annual delegations to China to tour what they, you know, a very curated view of the Chinese Communist Party. And and that's just one institution collaborating with them. You have Johns Hopkins, Georgetown, even the University of Chicago, they go on those trips. So it's I think that and two, there's kind of a buried lead there. When you see so many, so many leaders, especially in the Democratic Party, taking a soft line to China, a lot of these people come from top institutions like Harvard, like Johns Hopkins, like the University of Chicago. So you kind of see this view of China, specifically the Chinese Communist Party, that they receive from organizations who are giving them a, a very, very careful, very edited view of China. So no wonder why they treat it with such kid gloves and, and are very kind to them. Mm, yeah, actually, a lot of my work going back to 2008 mm -hmm. was specifically focused on exposing the United Front Work Department, which is what this is. That's the parent organization. Yes. United Front, just for our viewers, United Front mm -hmm. is the one of the main overt spy departments of the Chinese Communist Party dedicated to basically gaining control of the elite of a society and then using that control to influence the entire country. Exactly. And and when you talk about the elite, they really love to go after both former and current uh, elected officials, all the way down from state and local officials, frankly, all the way up uh, to the president. And we really saw, I think, in the last election cycle how important local level officials are, how important governors are. Even Joe Biden actually met with the chairman of the organization when he visited China in 2013, that same trip that he conveniently saw his son, Inca, very lucrative deal with the Bank of China and other entities, uh, but they've also hosted a ton, I would say dozens, of former members of Congress, even senators, uh, to do kind of the, the same thing that the, the media outlets do, and that they go to China, totally paid by, by QCEF, uh, and then in, in exchange, and again, you know, this isn't just uh, my opinion or, or conspiracy theories, these are within the Foreign Agent Registration Act filings, these are explicitly what they're hired to do, what they're supposed to do, so, you know, if that's what they're writing that they're doing, I'm sure there's definitely in, in many more words. nefarious things going on, yeah. But yeah, and then, yeah, and like you said, that that's just what they're telling us they're doing yes. based on what they're willing to disclose, yes. right? 
So what are they actually writing about being their intentions for this and why they're doing it? Yeah, so in, in that media Foreign Agent Registration Act filing, uh, they wanted to spread, quote, quote, positive messages and then disseminate favorable coverage. Uh, and they did this in two ways. Obviously, we talked about the trips to China. But even in the United States, the president of the lobbying firm that was kind of orchestrating this effort, he hosted a lot of these journalists at his house uh, in Washington, D.C., kind of as a representative of QCEP. And there were other officials there uh, as well on behalf of the organization. So, you know, who knows what they're talking about at dinner? Who knows the deals that are being made, both under the table and over the table? Uh, but, but they definitely have done a full-scale charm offensive, all the way to the think tanks to Hollywood, even, uh, for instance, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, which Biden's uh, selection to run the CIA, Bill Burns, he used to serve as the president of, uh, I believe he became president there in 2014. Uh, from, I believe, about three to four years on after that, that think tank kept collaborating with the China United States Exchange Foundation. They hosted uh, the founding chairman of the organization, and obviously they have an affiliated branch uh, with Sinjua University. So nonetheless, in his congressional hearings, he said that he cut ties uh, with QCEF, but that's, that's not the case. So really, I think it goes back to what I said in the beginning. All levels of government, all the way from your rank and file, uh, members of, of the administration of Joe Biden, to your state and uh, local level officials, all the way to the top really have been somehow contacted by some conduit of the Chinese Communist Party, whether it's QSAF or the China Trans-Pacific Foundation or some of these think tanks, which kind of masquerade as really espionage uh, opportunities and operations. Now, based on this organization's mm -hmm. stated purpose, you mentioned that they talk about disseminating positive views on the mm -hmm. CCP. Have you seen examples of after these meetings, the viewpoints of these journalists or you know, media organizations or think tanks or politicians change? Have you looked at the timing based on their you know, statements or coverage? Well, it's actually very interesting. And I'll give you one anecdote and then a, a kind of broader answer to that. But there is an individual who uh, attacked President Trump for critiquing Voice of America for parroting uh, Chinese Communist Party talking points with regard to COVID. So typically, I'm like, there has to be something there. There has to be a reason why, why he's attacking the president. And lo and behold, he had actually contributed uh, to the China United States Exchange Foundation's quarterly report uh, talking about somehow praising China. I forget what the specific article was, but nonetheless, there was a connection there. And frankly, in my opinion, when you interact with QCEF, you know, you don't go back. It's kind of a radioactive relationship in that once you've been contaminated, they, they have their channels, they, they can access you. But I think you just see it more, more generally uh, with just how the media treats China, whether it's, it's you know, in some cases, it's kid gloves, right? They, they don't really attack it with, with the issue that, or rather the uh, intensity that what's going on there deserves, whether it's the genocide of the Uyghurs or how they treat their, their working class people. But I also think sometimes they just refuse to cover the stories, whether that's with regards to Hunter Biden's hard drive. Uh, so yeah, I think they just kind of refuse to talk about a lot of the issues that people like us care about. Well, we know in the past that China had five no-go topics that, you mm -hmm. know, journalists, if they covered them in China, they, they were kicked out of the country. We saw this kind of cleaning house, you know, mm -hmm. so to speak, of the CCP of journalists who would speak against the Chinese Communist Party uh, really around the time of the Beijing Olympics going forward, right, 2008 mm -hmm. to 2010 roughly. You might remember, for example, that Bloomberg News, they, you know, they were writing some articles kind of critical of the CCP, and then China threatened to remove the Bloomberg <laughs> terminals from China. You know, in other words, attacking a side business mm -hmm. of the Bloomberg, you know, business structure if they didn't stop covering that. And they actually came out and said, okay, we're gonna not, we're not going to report negative stories on China now, essentially. Mm -hmm. And you, you saw this across the board, whether you're talking about human rights abuses, democracy in Hong Kong, uh, Tibet, sorry, t Taiwanese, uh, independence. These are the no-go topics. And, you know, we, if I'm curious now, what have you seen in terms of the main narrative structure uh -huh. of this organization through the United Front? You know, what issues do they encourage or what are they pushing and what issues do they discourage? Have, have you seen? Well, it's interesting that you uh, bring up Bloomberg News. First, obviously, they've taken sponsored trips from QCEF, but we've also done reporting at the National Pulse about how Bloomberg, in tandem with CNN and the New York Times, act they actually help fund and contribute both terminals and internships to the journalism school that's hosted at Sinjua University. Uh, they've not only contributed funds, but they've also essentially given internships to people who then go on 
on to work for state-run media outlets like China Daily. So really kind of training the enemy in that sense that they're they're training this very very uh, oppressive and hostile media outlet to America, uh, to American media outlets. But but with regards to the kind of stories that they either choose to cover or, or don't cover, I think it's kind of what I said before. It's a mix of both in which if they do decide to cover any of those topics that you just mentioned, uh, they never really take take a hard line approach. The people that they quote tend to come from think tanks, uh, institutions, universities that have been frankly compromised by the Chinese Communist Party. I'm inclined to think of uh, Dr. Li Meng Yan who put out a report about how COVID was intentionally released from, from a Chinese lab. And interestingly, the Harvard Center that attempted to do some huge debunking uh, of her report, uh, they actually have hosted fellows from Chinese state-run universities for years. Obviously, Harvard has taken hundreds of millions of dollars from, from the Chinese Communist Party. So you kind of just start to see how a lot of these voices that they use to then attack voices who are critical of, Ch of the Chinese Communist Party tend to somehow have some relation to the United Front. And on this too, do you see examples of them receiving gifts? You mentioned like dinner parties and so on. Mm -hmm. Are they receiving gifts, receiving money through this network? Yeah, so the, the private dinners are, are the main thing you see, which is kind of a, a typical thing in D.C., right? A lot of those lobbying firms do that. But I really think that the, the crux of the issue here is how these, these Western lobbying firms are aiding and abetting these organizations like the China United States Exchange Foundation because they're essentially fast tracking and really expediting these organizations abilities to to kind of find the weak spots I think in American society among our academic and political elite and who's willing to compromise and frankly sell out the country uh, by taking private dinners by taking trips to China uh, and, and even like I said you see these institutions when they kind of get castigated by China they then kind of bend over and they start funding uh, you know journalism schools like I said at these state-run universities so they definitely want to keep the the relationship open there because I think in the worldview of, of which you don't want to defend America against the Chinese Communist Party it is a very 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 lucrative grift to be on to be on that side and to be taking money from the Chinese government well, there's a few sides to this as well. I mean, first mm -hmm. off, as you mentioned, this organization is a foreign, is a registered foreign agent. Yes. The United Front is one of the main spy departments of the Chinese mm -hmm. Communist Party made to push these types of narratives and do the work that you found them doing. Yes. Actually. <laughs> And then on top of this, actually, it's important to note that the, for the Chinese Communist Party, this is this is war. They have what they call the Three Warfares Doctrine, mm -hmm. uh, media warfare, psychological warfare, and legal warfare actually adopted into their military code. And so things like this, this is war for them. You know, how, how do you see this kind of playing into the interests of the CCP? That is such a complicated question, but I, I really think it goes back to what, what you've talked about a lot, which is unrestricted warfare and the idea that, you know, this is going to take decades to play out, but it's really about embedding yourself within within the enemy. And I think that, you know, I, I hate to talk about Joe Biden and China so much because I think it's become such a talking point that it doesn't really warrant the nuance that, that it, it, it doesn't get it. When it, when it deserves it. But for instance, the person who's running his, his PPO, uh, which is kind of HR for the White House, he was a former fellow uh, at, a, at a Shanghai-based think tank, which we saw, I believe it was last year, uh, an American individual actually get indicted by the Department of Justice for selling American secrets. I believe it's the Shanghai Institute of International Studies or maybe, maybe American Studies. So I really think when you're talking about this kind of long-term strategy, to really just control the American government. Again, not directly. I, I've always said that, it, you know, when the Chinese Communist Party attempts to overtake the United States, it's not that they necessarily want to fly a Chinese flag over the White House. They just want everybody who's in that White House to somehow have liaised with them, whether through an organization like QCEF. They want them to come from university programs that have been entirely funded and bankrolled by the Chinese Communist Party, which you see going on at these elite institutions. They want, you know, the prescription drugs they're on to be made in China. We have no control over that. They want the suits they're wearing to be made in China because we've shipped all of our jobs overseas. So while they might, you know, not technically control the United States in these kind of indirect, more subversive ways, they totally have, have a very iron fist over a lot of the activities uh, and, frankly, the personnel at, 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 our, at our high levels of government. One thing you mentioned is actually very important, too. Mm -hmm. You mentioned this organization, this like study program of America or mm -hmm. foreign countries. A lot of people don't know what these are. 
The yes. Chinese Communist Party has programs to study the systems of foreign governments for the purpose of infiltration. Mm -hmm. They actually have a slogan. It's strangle you with your own systems. <laughs> and they look for loopholes within foreign systems and ways to manipulate foreign societies strategically and to the goals of the Chinese Communist Party. They, they research this stuff. <laughs> and the, the, this, is, this is partly, you know, of course, influence operations. It's partly, of course, you know, operations to compromise people through spy organizations, but it's also a form of warfare. Now, I'm, I'm curious, you mentioned also mm -hmm. that you've done research on some of these different government officials going there, including some of these caucuses. Why do you tell us about that? Yeah, so we just had a story uh, come out about the Congressional Black Caucus and how they've affi affiliated and really had a, a very intense relationship with the China United States Exchange Foundation for nearly a decade, if not over a decade. So there's kind of two leads from this story. One is that members of this caucus, which include Kamala Harris, include squad members like Ilhan Omar, uh, they have actually actually sent their, their student age constituents to China on these sponsored trips, the same ones that the, the media outlets have been going on. They toured Huawei facilities. It's, it's absolutely astounding. And if you go and read the article, you can see a lot of times the students who go on these trips, in exchange, they write blog posts uh, for, for the QCEF website. And in one of the posts, one of the, 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 the poor girls who went on the trip, she actually talked about how China is, quote, an amazing communist country that, that outperforms the United States in virtually every, uh, every level. So that, I mean, that is propaganda at its absolute finest. And then the other takeaway from that story, uh, the individual of the, the caucus who really spearheaded that whole effort uh, was a congresswoman by the name of Marsha Fudge. And people may know her now kind of uh, repopularized by the fact that she's actually Joe Biden's nominee and frankly probably will become uh, the secretary for housing and urban development. So she not only spearheaded the effort, but the first group of students who went overseas to China, again, they visited Huawei, they met with PLA officials, they got lectured at state-run universities. It was actually called the uh, Marsha L. Fudge Inaugural Cohort. <laughs> so that is not something that I would want my name on or anywhere near or subject my constituents to. Absolutely bizarre. Uh, but no, the media won't report on it. We have the pictures to prove it. You see the, the individuals posing under the Chinese Communist Party flag. They, they actually met with another group. Uh, the, it's one of the associations for friendship, which the Trump administration cracked down on and said, you know, no American organizations are to be affiliated or, or work with this. Other reports have, you know, labeled them as really the, the uh, public front uh, of the United Front. Uh, and again, Muriel Bowser's met with them, uh, academics from Harvard. You know, when you find these institutions, it's not an isolated in incident where you just see one person, one politician. It's the whole party. It's the whole institution. It's the whole university. It's the whole fellowship program. So as you say, they really know how to, how to get in there and kind of embed themselves within. Now, just last question. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're seeing a lot of odd hypocrisy here. Mm -hmm. If we go back to 2016, yes. the way that they framed the whole Trump-Russia allegations, mm -hmm. it was suggested that Trump worked with Russia to rig the elections, was they were saying, oh, these Trump officials had met with, you know, Russian oligarchs and Russian officials. You know, a lot of that was proven false over time mm -hmm. in terms of what was actually discussed and what actually happened. But here we actually have real examples <laughs> of public officials, elected officials, media organizations, think tanks, and so on, all working together in the same narratives, painting this. You know, what, how do you see this? I mean, it is, it is absolutely bizarre. Every, put, put it this way, I think a good kind of smaller scale story of this is like the Hunter Biden hard drive and how the media handled that. The people who went up there to discredit the hard drive, I remember we had a story up on the National Pulse. You know, one of the individuals, I believe he was a legal analyst on CNN, uh, which by the way, Fareed Zakaria has also lectured at that Sinjua University Journalism School that I'm, that I'm talking about, and a, fa a Facebook VP, so also big tech in China, are obviously uh, very in bed. But he, he actually was part of one of the lobbying firms that have done a lot of work on behalf of the Chinese. Chinese Communist Party. So it's just kind of a tangled web that you see a lot of these people in media who are telling us telling us to not worry about, you know, election collusion between the Chinese Communist Party uh, and Joe Biden. First of all, they're compromised by the Chinese Communist Party. But also, too, I, I think to 
some extent, obviously outlets like the Epic Times, the National Pulse, we try to get the message out there, but these mainstream media outlets, whether because they're compromised by QCEP or they're just not interested, but they don't really do the due diligence on the reporting on the you know rank and file members of the Biden administration and where they did their fellowships in their senior year of college, how they may have been contacted by some of these, these Chinese organizations. So I think it's a blend of not necessarily willful ignorance. I think it's calculated ignorance, but I think a lot of these outlets just don't understand the severity uh, and the complexity of what's going on there because the, the only kind of image of China that they've been presented with is one of being chauffeured around in very nice cars to Huawei facilities while in China, meeting and being lectured by former military uh, uh, professionals. So yeah, I think that you know, it's a, it's kind of a very twisted relationship between our American establishment and that of the Chinese Communist Party, and that it's a very lucrative win-win relationship where the Chinese Communist Party kind of buys the silence of our elites, of our officials, uh, and in exchange they can do things like basically, you know, implement, implant rather, a, a president like Joe Biden, who is obviously an agent of the Chinese Communist Party. Hey, Natalie Winters, thanks again for being on Crossroads. Thank you so much. <laughs>